Uh, we all got a bonus yesterday, $700 million plus. The government continues its uh, half-price public transport subsidy and uh, it continues the road user charger subsidy and um, it looks like a bribe in le- oh, and the fuel tax subsidy, of course. Um, the claim from the government is, oh, uh, Grant Robertson found a lazy $700 million when they went through some baseline review process. Rubbish. Rubbish. The new Prime Minister said, and look, might be some justification for this. Um, we can wave. Um, we should um, throw out some lollies. We should throw out some lollies to voters because we're in electoral tr- trouble. Interesting, interesting way to run things. Now, I am presuming that we're all good to go there, are we, Kelly? Okay, so our first guest uh, this morning, we had on uh, very recently, and can I just say I was kind of uh, a bit blown away by the response we had to Winston Peters' take on the departure of Jacinda Ardern. It is one of the most viewed on Facebook, YouTube, everywhere interviews that we have ever ever done, like over a quarter of a million people, I think. It was just, it was off um, the charts. Mystery to me why you're so interested in Winston Peters, but uh, New Zealand First ended the year last year doing very well in the polls and looking for all the world like real contenders. Then we have these two polls out this week that show the bump, the kind of expected bump for Labour and Chris Hipkins. But interestingly... Uh, Winston Peters in New Zealand first, not pushing at five, but kind of in the doldrums, uh, along with some other minor parties. And for some reason, Leighton Baker, the man who would be king, uh, being Prime Minister, a guy not even running. So what's up with New Zealand first, and what does Winston Peters make? Are Chris Hipkins in the new job? Has anything really changed, or is it just window dressing? He joins us now. Uh, Mr. Peters, welcome to the platform. Nice to have you back. Good morning. All right. You must have been disappointed when those two polls came out this week because you were looking, you were sitting pretty pretty, uh, pretty good in the last poll of last year. You know what I think of those polls and the polling system in New Zealand compared to international respectable polling. So let's not waste any time from being concerned about polls that don't matter. What we had here was, and I was astonished by your colleagues in the media not understanding this, this is just like the Shipley bump that she got when she rolled Jim Bolger. It yeah. lasts for about two minutes. This is what's happening here as well. So let's not have all this inexperience parading itself as political commentary. Wait five or six weeks and see what happens here. Yeah. One thing that has become clear, Winston, is that this wasn't a Prime Minister who ran out of gas over Christmas and came back and surprised everyone uh, by saying she was leaving. Uh, The smoothness of this transition, the fact that, if you like, the power structures behind Labor haven't really altered, um, and most of our commentators say this, this was just what they did with Jacinda back in 2017. The Labor Party looks at its chances and says she's got to go, right? Well, the reality was that those uh, support base reads, readings that you can take were all looking the wrong way. The so-called gloss had gone off. It was downhill, and uh, <laughs> the paradox was that Jacinda used the same excuse as John Key, no more in the tank. Whereupon, if guys gets a job <laughs> for a bank and other organisations, and in her case, the same thing. So, you know, it's a grain of salt situ- situation. The reality is... We're not talking about somebody like Helen Clark, good for three terms, but someone who was not going to win in 2023, and that's the reason why they changed. Yeah. All right. And they bring in Chris Hipkins, who it seems to me, in perception at least, uh, Winston, uh, is trying to take the edge off, and I'm not going to say their policies, but issues which have caused Labor problems. And one of them is an issue which I think you are making huge ground on and an issue you've been very clear on, the issue, the issue of co-governments, governance, the Treaty of Waitangi and one person, one vote, or in New Zealand's case, one person, uh, two votes. It looks like Labor's going to try and, and walk that back. Surely that's got to be bad for you. 
Well, again, if it's bad for me and good for the country, what what does it matter? But the fact is they won't walk it back. They're so far down and so donkey deep now, they cannot do that. But you've got someone who's saying, look, for the last five years, we've mucked up on all the transformation promises we made. You go to it. Public health, mental health, roading. Everywhere you look, there's been a disaster in the handling of things. And he's trying to say, forget about that. We've made a five years of our personal mistakes as ministers, and I'm talking about them, not us. And as a consequence, we want now to focus on bread and butter issues. That is the issues that they were voted on by ordinary workers to attend to. They are admitting they spent five years neglecting them. Yeah. All right. Do you think they will halt? Uh, and with Nanaya Mahuta gone as Minister of Local Government, demoted in fact, though she's got your old job, Minister of Foreign Affairs, do we? Do you believe that they will push pause on the, on that policy to try and win, win more voters back? They'll be telling you they're pushing pause whilst not doing so. They have, uh, as was the plan by Nanaya Mahuta, and it's an old strategy of Labour's, is to let Pandora out of the box and try and say to the rest of us, you won't be able to get Pandora back in again, the box again. And that is the circumstance in which other parties must face the courage and the grit to do something about it. And that's where the party I lead is going to be of serious importance in 2023, as we were putting a handbrake on it before 2020. Yeah. Uh, and your argument, of course, is that you weren't told about a lot of the changes uh, that were coming, that you were misled uh, by Jacinda Ardern and her administration. The truth is, though, this is fundamentally the same administration, isn't it? Oh, precisely. All the key operatives and players that were there doing that, breaching trust in terms of a coalition agreement, when you shake hands with people, you expect them to keep their word, and like Helen Clark did, and like, dare I say, Jim Bolter did. But you cannot get away with that. All the same operatives are still there. And the paradox is we have the new minister, Prime Minister talking about these um, petrol subsidies just yesterday against Grant Robinson saying last year that this simply weren't sustainable. Yeah, it was yeah, right that, here. That's right. It is remarkable, isn't it, that you can find a lazy 700 million or more just lying around because you go through some bureaucratic process. Um, we really can't see that as anything more than priming the pump, can we? Well, it's a harbinger for what's going to come out in the budget. There's going to be an election where they throw it around, they toss money around like an eight-armed octopus trying to win an election. It's a disaster for New Zealand long term because all the alternative areas where they should have been working when it comes to uh, cost of living and pricing, they have not been attended to. We have one of the highest set costs of living in the world. Mm. Uh, M Mr Peters, it's Waitangi weekend uh, coming up. What are you doing for Waitangi? Waitangi Day? Well, we're going there on the 5th, for example, who at uh, the uh, day when we're expected to be uh, at uh, Waitangi, uh, at the upper treaty grounds. Um, we've also seen diplomats and other people uh, in the meantime surrounding that circumstance. So that's the plan, and hopefully the weather stays good. All right. Is uh, are you going to Shane Jones' party? Is he having his traditional Waitangi Day party? Uh, well, it's before Waitangi, well, before but yes, I... the answer is... Yes, we, uh, it's the status quo, nothing changes. Okay. I've never... You know, I'll tell you what's never changed. I've never been invited. Though people were telling me that you just turn up, and that's okay with some co-op. Well, I can't believe you. You've all been invited. Right. I, I saw nothing in my email. That's all I'm saying, Winston. All right, it oh, is Waitangi. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get Shane to redress that today. Okay, very good. I mean, I cannot believe we've been so uncharitable as to not ask you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, maybe you can't afford the booze bill. Um, look, because it is Waitangi, <laughs> and I think this is the issue, and you identified it last year, and a lot of other commentators have, this issue of ethnicity, race, how the treaty relates to our, our, our democracy I think is one that has caused massive problems for Labor and I think has caused problems for Jacinda Ardern. We have had from Chris Hipkins an acknowledgement of that, oh, we've got it, no one understands co-governance. 
But we seem now in the two main parties to have two leaders, Lux and, uh, and Hipkins, who address it by saying, oh, I'm going to learn to speak Māori better or I'm going to learn te reo. We still haven't seen any, any policy change or any definitive... And I know where you stand on this. Same votes for everyone, regardless of their race. I know where David Seymour stands on this. The same, same position. Do you think it is behoving on on Mr. Hipkins to say, "I'm just speaking these words of change"? I still believe in in, in co-governance. I still believe in special rights for Maori under the treaty and the democratic process. Because it seems to me this is the opportunity. If he were going to steer the Labour's ship in a different direction this weekend's the weekend you'd do it. We have seen nakedly and openly since the 2020 election the unfolding of clear racist privilege policy, a disaster for this country. And it's been out there month after month in three waters and a whole lot of other things to do with the the BNZ, um, the TVNZ merger, to do with the health system, you name it, they've been doing it everywhere. And then he's asked, Mr. Hipkins, uh, what are the three principles of the Treaty of Waitangi? He didn't know what the answer were. He didn't have know how to answer it. I was astonished by that. So you've got them being taken down a pathway of uh, which they do not understand. And this man is the Prime Minister. Now, I'm not trying to give Chippy a hard time, but I was staggered that you could be in the inner fulcrum of the Labour Party on this huge issue in which you're selling the mass majority of the people in this country down the drain in favour of a very, very small minority, and you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. I, okay, so we would look for that this weekend. I don't, I don't think we're going to get it. You just called him, Chippy. You, you sound, I'm sorry, uh, and I think this is one of his political advantages. Uh, hi, on, on a personal level, he's a difficult fella not to like. How do you feel about the new Prime Minister? <laughs> well... When you're at the end of a supermarket chain at the counter and you're paying, you can call them every, every name you might like, but uh, establishing a hedonistic tone with respect to the personality and paying your bill to the supermarket is something different, and that's not going to change if the opposition is any good at doing what they should be doing. All right, but I, I want to get back to it. What, what do you think of him as a person? Let, let's put the politics aside, Winston. No, look, I don't, I don't go in for that sort of stuff. You know that for a long time I don't. Uh, you, in politics, it, you get all the criticism, you get all the statements, but the public is demanding you form a stable government and do something about running the country. And whether you like or dislike somebody, you've got to put it aside. Mm. If you're going to go into any arrangement, business or otherwise, on the basis of who you like and dislike, you're not going to go very far, nor is the organisation, of course, in which you're meant to be leading. Mm. Um, looking at those polls, as unreliable, as terrible, as outrageous as they are, Winston, which is because, uh, and you don't really want to talk about them, they did both say one thing about another party or, or where things were balanced, the possibility we might have a government chosen on the say-so of the Māori Party, a, a radical party, I think by New Zealand political standards, uh, a, a radical party that might hold the balance of power next election. Uh, how good or bad would that be for the country if that particular tail of the Maori seats wagged the dog of Parliament in general? Well, I think the prospect is already out there in front of you with the Maori members of the Labour Party making demands they cannot back up, either in the Maori world or in the general world. It's just astonishing you've got this contest or a struggle to the bottom or race to the bottom between the national, the Labour Party's Māori members and the Māori Party itself. And it's based on who can be the most racist of the two of them in pleasing a certain radical group of people whose version of history is demonstrably wrong. They don't know who was at Waitangi in 1840. They don't know why these people signed up. They didn't know, they still don't know why. There was a plea to the English to actually come to a treaty arrangement. All those things are shoved aside whilst you get the sort of sociological department of the university interpretation and misinterpretation of that, of the treaty. And that's manifest itself in politics. I know it sounds like a complex argument, but they're talking bulldust to the ordinary Maori mm. in whose name they make these claims and who are getting nothing out of it. Mm. They're growing wealthy, these people, Maori, on the backs of the misery of their own people, and that's got to stop. 
All right. You would hope, obviously, whether or not the polls are reliable, that you have more people saying they'd vote for New Zealand first when the next oh, set of polls. Sean, 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 can you, Sean, can you remember when Helen Clark called a snap election in 2002 and New Zealand first was on 1.8%? Yeah. yeah. And in four weeks we were on 10.8%. I mean, when I, how long do I have to put up with this sort of talk? <laughs> <laughs> we should know better. All right. <laughs> All right. I just want to, I want to close off another couple of uh, other issues because I... I think your responses might be entertaining and revealing. The new Mayor of Auckland, Wayne Brown, has been subject this week to, I think, a concerted left-wing or liberal media campaign just kicking him when he's down or up or anywhere. Um, and I think, kind of, oh, personally, I think a slightly unprofessional take at a time when the media should be concentrating not on the character of Wayne Brown but what Aucklanders need to do to keep themselves safe. Do you think journalists are drongos, Winston? <laughs> I do not think it. Some journalists are drongos, and I can prove it. <laughs> can I just tell you? I'll give an example. Yep. One guy attacked me and New Zealand First about the seri- from the serious fault office at uh, twenty nine times. We won in court twice. No apology. No. I'm sorry. We misled the whole electorate. We could be cause your reputation to be damaged. None whatsoever. We took them to the wire on the 22nd of July last year and beat the serious board office hands down. No apology, no forgiveness, no, no, no nothing. So I know what it's like. And in the case of what happened in Auckland, we had a worse than expected rainfall. Uh, but also, you recall, there was a forecast that there was going to be the same in Northland yesterday. Mm. Well, it's, Northland didn't happen. Sometimes these forecasts can be wrong. Sometimes they can be much worse than they predicted them to be. And sadly to say, the system got caught out. Now, I don't know what Wayne could have done but other than call an the emergency earlier, but that should have been up to the Met Service and all others as well. Yeah. He's relying upon information that's not in his purview, not in his control. Mm. What do you think about, you about, about two of the journalists involved, Simon Wilson and, and, and David Fisher? I'm sure you've dealt with them before. They seem to be leading the charge on him. Well, I'm surprised by David Fisher doing that. I mean, David usually is more accurate in terms of his analysis, uh, whereas Simon has had a long campaign <laughs> against uh, against uh, the new mayor and uh, had a long campaign favouring his opponent in the last campaign. That, of course, never appears at the bottom of the article. I backed the, the alternative to Wayne Brown. So mm. that's not a surprise to me at all. Yeah. I mean, let's say the days of of many journalists being professional, putting aside their personal prejudice, are uh, a long way ago. Okay. Present company accepted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't know if I want you saying that uh, uh, about me, Winston. <laughs> All right. Um, it is a different game with a different uh, Prime Minister. I personally think that he tends probably to work in your space because he's moved he's moved Labour away from certain... or he's trying to move, in perception, Labour away um, from from certain extreme posi- positions that we're not confident. Um, what is your response? Do you become more extreme in your rhetoric or do you just keep doing what you're doing? No, look, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, but they cannot imitate it. Can I just analyse this for you? We were there between 2017 and 2020. Look at my minister's performance on all those things, defence, foreign affairs, off- offshore aid, Kiwi Rail, provincial growth fund, billion trees, all these things. Compare that to Labour's ministers. One after the other, it was a disaster. They cannot deny it. Show me one area where they were successful. And then when you look at the uh, things going forward, they will say we're going to do this, this and that, but they all beg the question, but why in your sixth year are you coming to your senses? You've just wasted five. Mm. Mental health, 1.9 billion, five beds. I cannot believe that this is what it, what's acceptable mm. to a Labour supporter who should understand it's about ordinary people, not about the rich and the wealthy. Mm. Winston, thank you. It is good uh, to uh, talk to you uh, again. We'll see how many people watch this. Um, and I might see you. I might see you up at Shane's party, you know, if I get an invite. Well, I hope you, I hope you come. I hope you come. Yeah. But the number watching this is a better poll than what TV1 and TV3 did the other night. Yeah. That's a fact. Yeah.
That's why I'm pleased to be on here. Yeah. <laughs> Good on you, Winston. Thank you very much indeed. That is the leader of New Zealand First. Winston Peters, um, not out, and he says he's not down. The polls, of course, are rubbish. And every politician, every politician says that or no comment when the polls are not in their favour. But, um, no, interesting to see how New Zealand first responds to, to Chris Hipkins. Um, and I think Winston quite rightly saying, where did that $700 million to extend the subsidy come from? That's very bad budgeting if you find something like $700 million just lying down the back of the couch. It's like you haven't been paying attention. Um, and, yes, some journalists are drongos, according to Winston Peters. Um, and he seemed to be he seemed to be saying, look, leave Brain, Wayne Brown alone. Sean, um, and a lot of people liking that interview and sending me nice uh, messages uh, or interesting messages about it. Jesse says, love Winston. He's as sharp as a tack. It's no wonder every election year I find myself voting for him every time. Greatest politician in New Zealand history. Oh, Jesse, that's pretty, uh, that's out there, mate. Greatest in New Zealand history. Uh, stop kicking Wayne Brown. Everybody knows Elton John caused the floods, says Brendan. <laughs> I hope Ed Sheeran doesn't do the same in Wellington tonight. Um, Sean, the previous comrade also did not know offhand the three articles of the Treaty of Waitangi when asked. Seems to be a strong focus for Labour. Can I be perfectly honest? I wouldn't know the three articles of the bloody treaty anyway. It's not like you have to. And I personally think, of course, that the treaty over time is just no basis to run a constitutional democracy in the 21st century. And we should come up with a constitution that is fair and even to all, not to say we shouldn't redress past wrongs between the Crown and people whose stuff they nicked or whose lives they damaged. All right, uh, happy to take uh, your calls, texts on Winston. We'll have time to talk about that interview, which will be up uh, within half an hour of the show, finishing at 10 o'clock, um, full show replay, and we will have that as a special content. All right, it is uh, seven... Oh, no, we've still got 20 or 30. You notice I've tried to be a little bit more accurate on the time lately. You've done well. Well done. You know, Kelly, we I are... I noticed get... your watch on your, your wrist is about a minute early. Yes, that's so that I'm never so, late for anything. Oh. Right. Oh, I say, oh, look, there you go. Oh, no, I've got another 60 seconds. You know, it's good. It's <laughs> we're good just filling in the time now, aren't we? Yeah, that's right. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you can say the floods were not caused by climate change, I'll vote for you, Winston. Well, they weren't. Well, they were, but climate change is actually just weather. Um, it's all the commies in the Green Party, and Greenpeace have said that it's something else, and it's us. Oh, that'll get me in trouble.